was buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of weight It was my doom Till I met you I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my due Till I met you Can you come my name? How you guys doing? Good to see you. Would you turn to somebody around and say, hey, I know you. Well, it's good to be back with you. We're just rolling through town, visiting. Um, good to see you guys. Uh, missed you. Uh, we're, we're doing fine over in the wilderness of California. But, uh, <laughs> but it's good to see you guys and uh, to be back in time to rub it in that the Dodgers went to the World Series and the Giants did not. Um, I don't care about how many rings recently. Nobody cares. So, mostly because I'll cry. <laughs> uh, 
but let's pray and so we can get back to being spiritual. <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that you are here. We thank you that you are a God who has given all of yourself for us to give all of ourselves back to you. God, you've bridged the gap for us that through your death and resurrection, we have the power to conquer death. We have defeated the grave because you have called us out. God, we just thank you that you have set us free. Now I have resurrection power living on the inside, Jesus. You have given us freedom. No longer bound by sin and darkness, living in the light of your goodness. You have given us freedom.
chains are gone up and pass out the elements and we're going to take them together in, in just a moment and as they're passing that stuff out uh, you can, there's a cup with the juice on top and then on the bottom there's another cup with the little um, the wafer underneath just if you need, need to know the details I'm one of those guys I need to know the details uh, I love when we get to declare thank you so much when we get to declare truth through song because that's part of what worship is. It's not only is God our audience when we worship Him, but we're often reminding ourselves of who He is and what He's done and what He's at work doing in our life through our songs. And as we just declare that we found freedom, and to the degree that we haven't yet, freedom is there for the taking in Christ. And anybody found a sense of freedom in areas of your life through your relationship with Jesus? You have one, one, it's awesome. We're making ground. Um, and when we take communion, here, here's what happens is, uh, which by the way, if, uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know, you participate with us in communion. If you're not, you're just kind of checking things out. You can let the elements pass. No pressure, no worries on not participating in this moment. Um, but when we take communion, you often go like, what's this all about? And part of what communion is and the power of it is that it's a moment of remembrance. It's a moment of remembering the price that Christ has paid for your and my freedom. Freedom from the penalty of sin. Freedom from the power that that sin can hold over our life. And when we think about what Jesus has done, as we you know, drink of this juice and take of this little wafer in just a moment, it's, it's, it's simply a symbol of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for you and for me. 
And it's a symbol of the broken, beaten body of Christ on the cross that was broken and beaten for you and for me. Literally, Scripture says that the, the penalty of sin, the wrath of God, the holiness of God was satisfied in what was poured out on the body of Christ at the cross. That's what we remember in this moment. And that's why we sing with gratitude and thankfulness for what he's done. Let me read these scriptures to you, and we're going to take these elements. Here's what it says in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I want you to grab that cup underneath with the bread, and I'm going to do a balancing act here. And grab that little wafer, and we're going to pray and take this. Lord Jesus, we, we just pause for a moment. Everything else in our life, Lord, we choose to set aside for this moment and focus our thoughts on you. It was your body that was broken on the cross for us. And we sit here today free free to worship you free to follow you because of the price you paid so we thank you for your broken body you can go ahead and eat of the, of the wafer and then it continues and says this verse 25 in the same way after, su after supper he took the cup saying this is this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The covenant that you and I stand in is the covenant of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness that was sealed through the blood of Christ. Not just an ink out of a pen. It was the blood of the Son of God. And so we drink this in remembrance of that covenant. That covenant. Go ahead and drink in the cup. Lord, we thank you so much for what you've done for us. And we continue to worship in this moment because you are Christ the King, the Lord of all. And we adore you, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand back up and continue to worship for a moment.
still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me yet I never will forget you never failed me yet And I never will forget
you change everything. God, we just thank you that you are a God who is here. You are here now. We don't have to wait for your presence, God. You have, you have come into this place. God, we thank you that you have set us free. There's nothing that can hold us back. There's nothing that you are not bigger than. God, I pray that we would step into the freedom that you have for us today. That we'd be free from worry, that we'd be free from anxiety. That you set us free from depression, that you set us free from anything that can hold us back from living the life you've designed us to live. Not for the glory of ourselves, but for the glory of you. God, let us not be ruled by fear. Do not give us a spirit of timidity. He gave us a spirit of power and his strength. We thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Well, thank you so much, LifePoint. You may be seated. Yes, I know. This was super fun this morning. Thank you, Josh. It was like old times. I even got to pick on him a little bit, so it was super sweet. Well, welcome. My name is Wendy. I am the Director of Education here at LifePoint Church. And if you are new or visiting this morning, I just want to say a special welcome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and thank you for just choosing to be here with us this morning. Inside your program, when you came in, you should find a connection card. If you could fill that out and take it out to our visitor center at the front, we would just love to get to know you. And we have a special gift for you for just joining us this weekend. So thank you. In just a few minutes, I'm going to invite the ushers forward, but first, I want to talk about this past Wednesday, Halloween. We had over 80 volunteers. Yeah, you can woohoo. It was awesome. We had over 80 volunteers that helped put this event on, and because you give, we were able to love on families with a free event. And I just want to share one quick story. I had one mom who came up to me and just thanked me personally because her daughter is about 10 years old and has major food allergies, so trick-or-treating, not a thing. Halloween parties, not a thing. It's not fun for her. But she was having the best time because she got to jump in bounce houses and face painting and games. So thank you, LifePoint, because you give. We're able to do events like this and love on our community. So thank you. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward, and I have just a few announcements of some things that are going on here at LifePoint. Who are all the men in the room? Whoop, whoop, let me hear you. All right. Well, there's an event coming up on the 16th, and I think this video will give you just a little bit more insight into what's going on in LifePoint Men. Father God, just wanted to thank you today for bringing this LifePoint Men together today because some of my brothers was able to say some things that I needed to hear that I don't even realize yet, but I probably will tomorrow. And, and the way that we click up together as a family, a brotherhood, being safe by the blood of Jesus, we're, we've all heard something we needed to hear today. And I'm thanking God for LifePoint that we are able to get together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for LifePoint. Hey, guys. Uh, just want to tell you how great of a night this was. Um, just to see the fellowship was absolutely amazing. Um, you know, seeing, seeing a bunch of men get together who, who struggle with the same things that you don't think other men are struggling with. Um, it's great to see that that you actually have help out there and, and you're not alone. So um, I had a great night and hope to see you next time. All right. So again, November 16th, part two, Justin Mitchell is going to be leading that. So make sure, men, that you come and get signed up for that. Next, we have baptisms. Who's ready to celebrate baptisms? Those are coming up in just a couple of weeks, and we would love for you to take that next step of faith. If you are ready to make that outward declaration of that inward decision that you've made to follow Jesus, please stop by our Connection Center today to get more information, get plugged into a class, and then we can celebrate baptisms with you in just a couple weeks. And last but not least, I want to share with you Operation Christmas Child. We've been talking about that for a couple of weeks. Yeah, super excited. We, once again, are a drop-off location, and so our drop-off week is November 12th through the 19th. If you need more information or you want to pick up your boxes or you want to sign up to help be a part of picking up those boxes and being here, just stop by the lobby later today and they will be sure to get you set up. And with that, would you help me welcome Scott Rogers back to the stage. Thank you, Wendy. Let's just let Wendy know how much we appreciate her, man. Those were actually some really good announcements. Way to go. Sorry, that was an underwhelming response, Wendy. Come on, let her know how much you guys are thankful for... Because, you know, doing announcements is not easy. 
Uh, you can try it sometime, and you'll just find out how interesting it is. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Scott, and I'm thrilled to be here with you. And I have, uh, I'm just going to get the bad news out of the way right out of the gate. I'm going to be here for three, week- three weekends in a row. My apologies up front. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, uh, but if this is your first time visiting LifePoint, man, I'm thrilled that you're here on, on behalf of Pastor Roy and your leadership team. We're just glad that you're here. If you're coming to check out what's going on at LifePoint, let's give it up for anybody who might be here for the first time. Let's let them know, come on, man, we're glad you're here. I hope you, feel, hope you have a great experience today. Um, we are going to have a three-week series of conversations that uh, I'm grateful that Roy and the team asked me to do this that are going to be based on a book that I wrote a couple of years ago called Now What? Everybody say, Now What? And uh, it's, it says, it's Now What? An Honest Look at Following Jesus Through Life's Difficult Times. Anybody ever had a difficult time in life? And a few of us? Okay. Um, and we're just going to unpack a lot of uh, some of my story and what God has done through that. And here's, here's a little bit of the backdrop for this whole deal. Is, and I've alluded to this a couple times while being here. Um, 2010 to 2015 was, uh, quite honestly, without exaggeration, the hardest season of my life. It was, it was the worst years of my life. Just three years ago, right? Got through that. And, you know, married to Shelly, a father to three teenagers, pastoring at a church, and I went into a season that was so difficult and dark that I didn't know if I was going to make, make it through. I was, thought I was just going to be one of those statistics in life. And I realized in the midst of this, I had to literally fight for my life in so many ways. We're going to get into some of that throughout these next three weeks. Um, but I realized that in this whole deal, that five-year season that felt like forever, um, I, I, I realized that God often does his greatest work in us during our season of greatest trial. And I learned so much more about him than I knew And I learned a lot more about myself than I realized. And when I got through that season, I really felt strongly impressed by God to share the story. Because the more that I talked about it, I realized I wasn't the only one who walks through these certain things. And a lot of folks, followers of Jesus, have a sense of shame and go into hiding because we feel like we're the only one walking through some of these struggles. And I just felt like, man, I'm going to share my story, hang the laundry out on the line and let it be, and I'm going to write it down as best I can and make a book out of it. And I just got to tell you that um, the fruit of these conversations and and even this little paper thing here has has just blown my mind at what God has done with it. And so I'm excited to have this three-week series with you guys. If you're interested in any of this that I might say and you want to take it further, uh, the books are out there. You can grab one if you want. They are 10 bucks a piece. And if you're thinking, man, that's a lot for a book, you go through five years of hell. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you $10 if I can skip that. All right, is that, is that the deal? So anyway, anybody want, want to call? I'm just going to give one away just for fun, first hand up. All right, here you go. I'm going to hand it to you, buddy. There you go. Enjoy. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's get into this thing. Um, when I was about 10 years old, Living in rural Michigan, a lady knocked on our door at our house. Never saw her before. Our neighborhood was probably 30 little houses, and uh, it's middle of summer. She knocks on our door, actually the beginning of summer. School had just gotten out, and and she says, hey. Well, first I was surprised because rarely do people knock on our door. And even more rare was the fact that people that I had never seen before knocking on our door. And so she says, hey, uh, my name is so-and-so. I honestly don't remember her name. And she hands me this little, little uh, piece of paper, and she says, I want to invite you to vacation Bible school. <laughs> and I had never had, uh, you know, I'd been in church just a couple times in my life, and when she said the, the phrase vacation Bible school, it was a foreign statement to me. I thought, what did you just say? Vacation Bible school, because vacation in school and the same as the same thing don't make sense. And the only understanding or recollection I had of the Bible was this big leather-bound, white leather-bound book that was stuffed in the closet. 
in our house. And when she said vacation Bible school, I didn't know what was going on. And she says, well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell stories. We're going to have crafts. We're going to play games. And I'm kind of like, yeah, whatever. And then she said the magic words. There's going to be candy every day. And I thought, well, why didn't you tell me candy was on the menu? All right, I'm in. Where and when? And she gives me you know, the paper. She says, starts tomorrow, and it's at the little church down the road. And so this picture Henry's going to put up for us is literally the church in our neighborhood. I took that picture about three years ago on my phone. The church is still there, and we met on those steps for Vacation Bible School. And there's about 20 of us that showed up that morning, almost all the kids in our little neighborhood. And so we get into the thing, and she's it's like one adult and all these kids. And so she starts the stuff, and I don't remember if it was crafts or doing or story, but there was this kid in in the in the mix that was unruly and really disobedient and wasn't following any of her instruction. In fact, it looked like this kind of became entertaining to, to everyone because it looked like this kid had a talent for pushing hot buttons. And it got to a point where it escalated where this, the vacation Bible school lady, who was probably full of love but really short on patience, <laughs> and this kid pushed her hot button so much, she just swelled up and she yelled at this kid. She's like, you are leaving now. Go, get out. And all the kids were like, Whoa, the drama at vacation Bible school. She's like, you're done. Get out. So I left. (laughs) And I got on my little little 20-inch BMX bike, and I ride off down the street, dirt road, and I go down, and I get about maybe 100 yards away, and a thought hits me. I'm like, hold on. No, 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 no. This is my neighborhood. Not yours. This isn't right. So I quickly devised a plan. I turned my bike around. I head back towards the vacation Bible school. All the kids are all sitting on the steps. And I reach down in the gravel road, and I grab a handful of stones. And I get about from here to that back wall, and I just start doing my very best, man. I'm launching all of my munitions at everybody. And kids are starting to scatter and all this stuff. And the vacation Bible school lady's like, you stop it right now. You get out of here. And I was all done with the rocks. I got back on my bike, and I took off, and I'm like, I win. I win. I proved my point. This is my neighborhood. And I rode off. And I... I always wondered, what was that night like for that lady when she went home? What was she thinking? Like, I'm just speculating, but I mean, if, if she's anything like me, I, I'm, I'm thinking, God, this is crazy. I thought, God, I thought I heard from you. I thought you kind of put it on my heart to go to this little rural neighborhood and do this vacation Bible school thing. God, this is not going very well. And I wonder if she maybe even said, God, and I got to tell you right now, this can't be your purpose for my life because, you know, God, what is your purpose? Because surely this is not it. Anybody ever prayed that kind of thing? Like, this isn't it, God. You know, not all of my friends believe in God. But everyone I know believes in finding a purpose for their life. And for those of us who desire to discover God's purpose for our life, Jesus says something in Matthew 4.19. He says, come, follow me. You ever heard that before? Which I've always thought, it begs the question, where are we going? You ever thought that? Like Jesus says, hey, follow me. Well, where are we going? What's this look like? And he gives us kind of a, I think, an introduction into what it looks like to follow Christ. And it's in Matthew chapter 7. So if you have a Bible, open it up. Matthew chapter 7. Scriptures are going to be on the screen for you as well. Here's what it says. And these are the words of Jesus. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. says, you can enter God's kingdom Only through the narrow gate. Now pause there for just a moment. Narrow gate. What does that mean? You know, if we we read the New Testament, we quickly realize that this narrow gate terminology 
isn't about a long set of things to perform or religious behaviors or things to do just right. What we realize is the narrow gate is Jesus. He, he says later in the New Testament, he is the way to the Father. In John 10, he talks about being the shepherd to the sheep. He, had, he says, I'm the shepherd, but what's he also say in that, that, that story? I am also the gate. He who comes through me will be saved. So the gate he's talking about, it's Jesus. It's a narrow path. It's through Christ. And then it goes on. He says this, the highway to hell is broad. Of course, we all know that because ACDC told us so, <laughs> right? I'm on a high. All right, sorry. It's just where I go, Roy. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. It's really the path of least resistance. And then it goes on and says this, but he says, the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is, the road is paved with roses and glory and awesome and easy and difficult, and only a few ever find it. Any of you here who are followers of Christ ever find it difficult being a follower of Jesus? Come on, man. It's like confession time, right? It's not easy. This path of following Christ at times can be really difficult. You know, what I wish is, I wish that, that following Jesus was like going down the highway. You know, cruising down the highway, we're, made, we're going 80 miles an hour, it's smooth pavement, we're flying along, it's, it's, the signage is awesome, we know exactly where we are, how far it is to where we want to go, we know all the exit ramps and all the on-ramps, and at night it's very well lit. And I just wish at times, I'm like, God, could I just, following you, just be like cruising down the highway, man, just... No resistance at all. I know exactly where I'm going. But I got to tell you, and most of you would agree with me, following Jesus at times is like, it's like going down the back roads. Like I'm not entirely familiar with Minden and, and Carson City, but I know that the back roads where I grew up in Michigan, they're dirt roads. And they're full of what we call chatter bumps, where you like do that thing. And there are no signs on the dirt roads. Nothing. And when you go down a dirt road at night, it is pitch black. There is no light except for the headlights going up to the next piece of the horizon, and that is it. And I think following Jesus, it's, it's often like that. It's like, man, it's not a smooth path. There are no signs. It's not well lit. You go down the dirt roads before GPS, and if so many of you know, you get lost down the, down the back roads. What do you do? You just keep going because at some point, you're going to pop out somewhere that's somewhat familiar and it's going to be all right, right? And often it's like that being, follow, being a follower of Christ. It's like, I'm not sure where this is going to lead, but I just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And I had uh, a real back rows experience that did start in 2010 that kicked off this, this whole journey. I was working at a church, wonderful church, amazing. God's doing incredible things. And uh, my, my wife, Shelly, you know, loved where we lived, and she has a great job. Our kids love their school, love their church. Everything is just is incredible. And I get this phone call, and this guy says, hey, Scott, I'm in town today. And uh, he, he says, you know, I know we've talked about this before, and you weren't interested, and you didn't think the timing was right, but I have some new information for you. And... I said, oh, new information, okay. And he says, well, let's, let's go to lunch today. Are you available? I thought, nah, sure. I, I, and he said, where we're going to go? I thought, oh, that's a nice place. At least I'll get a nice free meal out of this deal. I'll see you there in a half hour. So I go to lunch, and this guy sits down. He says, hey, you know this church, and you know that they want you to be on their staff, and in fact, they want to invite you to be their next pastor. And, he, he, and I'm like, hmm, okay, interesting. It's Pretty big church. And I'm thinking, okay, well, man, that kind of strokes the ego. That's kind of a cool role. And I'm like, okay. And, and then he says, and here's how much they want to pay you. And where I come from, what he said, I was like, is this a joke? Like, are you serious? I mean, if this is true, I, I'm, you know, we don't have to worry about college. We don't have to worry about anything based on my context. 
And before I was like, man, I might better pray about this. And then once he said, how much do you want to pay me? I'm like, God, this is God. You ever do that? Like, this has got to be God. This is incredible. So I went home and took me a bit to convince my wife, Shelly. She was hesitant. And she's like, I don't know. And I, I took me like a, a day or two, kind of talk her into it. And so I said, all right, I'll take the job. And so I go, we move, and I start in my job. And the plan was to have a, like a two-year transition, handing the keys off to me uh, to, to lead this church. And I quickly discover that the, um, the, the current leader's definition of integrity is entirely different than mine. And I began to see things that I'd only heard people talk about in other circles that what could happen in churches. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is not good at all. And so I, and, and, you know, I, I made some mistakes. I'm impatient, you know, a hard driving kind of guy and trying to get results quickly. And it got to a point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. This is driving me crazy. And I, I, I'm just a mess. And so my wife and I were like, yeah, let's, let's, let's step away from this. So I tell the church, I'm like, hey, I, I'm, I'm thinking about stepping away. And um, the response was, and I'm overseeing at that point the whole staff, you know, 50 people on staff. And, did it, you know, turning things around, we have momentum and all this stuff is going on. And I'm like, I just can't, I can't, I can't, I can't stand on stage and have my stomach turn because of what's going on behind the scenes. And, uh, and, and they said, well, that's fine. Just leave right now. You're done. Get out. Don't even go clean your desk out today. Just leave. And it was devastating. Devastating not because I, real, because I wasn't there. Devastating because for the next 20 years plus, that's where I saw myself. That was the vision I had for the rest of my life. And it was gone like that. And I spiraled into a really dark place emotionally. And in the third week of this series, we're going to get into that and what God did with that in specific. But I went to a really dark place. And the crazy thing was, was that, you know, I, I know what it's like to be a sinner. But I hate feeling like a loser. And I felt like a loser. And I literally believe that I sabotaged God's purpose for my life. I'm like, this is it. I've blown it, I put all my chips in, and the dice didn't fall my way, I'm done. And I went to a really challenging place, and I began to just lean into the scriptures and go, God, what's, where are you, God? What began as a, this is God, man, this is awesome, quickly turned into, God, I missed you. You ever do that? Like, when things look great, we're like, this is God, and then when it all blows up, we're like, God, where are you? You know what I mean? And, and I started leaning into God's word even more. And I came across this passage. And let me read this to you. And it really began to speak to me. And it's in Matthew 16. And I got a lot of clarity out of this. Because here's what it says in verse 24, Matthew 16. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Again, sounds like an easy road, right? Mm -mm. And then he says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And it's in reading that I really got clarity because I thought I had messed everything up. And I came to this place of peace realizing, you know what? It was better for me to lose the dream job then compromise my convictions. And I'm going to need to trust God with this outcome and where this is going to go. And I also began to get greater clarity than ever on God's purpose for my life because I thought that I had genuinely blew it. And this is where I arrived. And this is where it's the same for us all. Literally, I have some great news for you. I'm going to tell you and myself and me, what God's purpose is for our life. But here's the, here's, here's the warning in this. When we're done in about 10 minutes, there is no longer any excuse not to live it out. No longer will you have to ever walk in uncertainty about what God's purpose is for your life. Do you want me to tell you what it is? Yeah? 
Okay, here, here it is, and we're going to unpack it for a moment. God's purpose for our life is to participate in fulfilling his purposes for the world. That's why we're here. Christian, non-Christian, doesn't matter. God's ultimate purpose for our life is to participate in fulfilling his purposes for the world. So what's that mean? Let's, let's get specific. Okay, there's a conversation Jesus has with, with this religious guy, and it's in Mark chapter 12. Many of you know this, but stick with me on this. And the religious guy says to Jesus, hey, uh, what's the greatest commandment? Right? And Jesus responds, and he says this in verse 30 of Mark 12. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Have you guys heard this before? All right. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. If God's purpose for you and for me is to participate in fulfilling his purposes for the world, it continues by loving God with all of our heart and loving people with all of our might. So let it soak in for a moment. Not foo-foo love. Not like favorite flavor of ice cream love. Like living a life of surrender and commitment to Christ, and loving others in a way that lifts their dignity, serves them well, there's one more piece. Because Jesus says in Matthew 28, after he's, res- he's risen from the dead, before he literally ascends to heaven, he tells all of his disciples, go into the world and tell everybody the good news, right? We call that the Great Commission. And so God's purpose for you and for me to be specific is loving him with all of our heart, loving people with all of our might, and introducing others to Christ. The great commandment and the great commission. And here's the thing. And this this is super simple, right? But we complicate it. Let Let me try to convince you by saying this. You and I can do anything we want in our life except sin. And if we love God with all of our heart, we love people with all of our might, and we allow God to use us in some way to be salt and light and introduce others to Christ, we can do anything else we want, and we are right on with God's purpose for our life. Let me say it this way. We can do what seems like great, great things. But if we don't love God with all of our heart, love people with all of our might, and allow God to use us to introduce others to Christ, we've totally missed God's purpose for our life. Maybe you're saying, but but Scott, but Scott, but what about, what about, okay, okay, let's let's break it down. Let's say that's 90%, 90% of God's purpose for our life. Everybody say 90%. What about the other 10? I call that the troublesome 10%. And the troublesome 10% is all of the other stuff of everyday life. God, what's the career path you want me to choose? God, do you want me to go to college? If so, where do I go? God, who do I marry? God, do I buy a house or do I rent? God, do I, do I buy a used car or a new car? God, who do I hang out with? Right? All that's, and there's, what's funny is that that's the stuff that gets us all confused. And we end up in coffee shops with Roy or somebody else going, I don't know what God's purpose is for my life. Is it a Toyota or is it a Ford? I don't know. And, we just, and we're like, oh, let, let me suggest this. If we live well, the 90%, often much of the 10% falls right into place. We major on the majors, and the minors work themselves out. I did throw in the book a little bit of an extra kind of a grid, of like a biblical decision-making filter. You can check it out if you're interested. But really, that's it. That's it. You know, when I I wrote this... um, kind of in the middle of it, I'm like, what am I going to call this thing? And, uh, and I thought, I've got a cool title for this. I'm going to call it God Loves Losers. And that's what all my friends thought, too. I'm like, hey, what do you think, man? I'm, I'm, ri- I'm writing this out, and I'm gonna, I want to call it God Loves Losers. And everyone but one friend was like, you know, the truth-telling friends that we have, they're like, well, that's really stupid, Scott. <laughs> Who's going to walk around with a book that says, God loves losers, you know, right? And I'm like, no, 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 you don't get it. In my study of scripture, 
Do you realize that those whom God used to fulfill his purposes in this world lost much along the way? That's the losing that I'm talking about. And it seems like God loves to use people who are willing to lose something temporary to be used to make something happen for the eternal. But they still were like, nah, it's still a dumb title. Don't call it that. So I had to change it. Let me bring you back to the vacation Bible school lady, and we'll wrap this up. So she comes to our neighborhood and does her deal. The unruly kid gets kicked out and throws rocks at her. Maybe she goes home and says, God, this is crazy. This isn't worth it. This can't be your purpose for my life. Let me ask you this question. Would you assume, do you think it'd be safe to assume that she did this little vacation Bible school in this neighborhood where no one who she, who she was, first because she loved the Lord? Anybody? You think that was a motivating factor? Okay. Do you think that her doing the vacation Bible school was an expression of loving people with all her might? Do you think that the vacation Bible school somehow, some way, at some point was going to be a way to introduce those kids to Christ? She was doing exactly what God's purpose was for her life. It's not tied to how it goes in the circumstance. She was doing exactly what she was supposed to be doing. God's purpose for our life is not complex. We participate in fulfilling his purposes for the world. How do we do that? We love him with all of our heart. We love people with all of our might. And we allow God to use us to introduce others to Christ. And if we major on that, never again will any of us in this room walk away going, I don't know what God's purpose is. I don't know what it is. You know, even in the hardest of circumstance, the last thing we want to be doing when things are tough is questioning God's purpose for our life. Don't waste that energy on that. We know what it is. Let's live it out through whatever we're walking through. But what do we do when we're living out God's purpose in this way and things still fall apart? That's my teaser for next week. Because next week we're going to talk about what do you do when doing what's right goes wrong? Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah? I'm going to give this, I just like to give them away because it's kind of fun. And I'm going to give this young man right here, I'm sorry, he, uh, in, in um, Seahawks, I don't know about that, so I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> All right, let's pray, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much. God, thank you for, um, for clarity. Lord, no longer do we have to wonder what your purpose is for us. Yeah, Lord, we know there's, a whole bunch of small decisions and things along the way. But from from a macro standpoint, God, we know that you're calling us to love you with all of our heart, to love others with all of our might, to allow you to use us to introduce others to Christ. So Lord, I pray that this simple conversation would really be a foundation for the rest of this series. And God, more than that, that many of us would walk out of here today never having to waste energy wondering what your purpose is for us but we're just called to live it out in the details of everyday life. And Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand on up, you guys. Um, You're dismissed, and we'll see you next week if I didn't scare you away, all right? Again, if you want to grab a book, they're out in the lobby. Thanks, guys.